Hey everyone, Dr. Bagbinger here. Today we'll be talking about the very first type of glaucoma, the primary open angle glaucoma, right? So primary open angle glaucoma is an optic neuropathy characterized by increased intraocular pressure and or visual defects, right? That is basically the definition of every glaucoma ever, right? It is an optic neuropathy and it is characterized by increased intraocular pressure and visual field defects, right? This definition applies to all the glaucomas, right? Except this part with the normal appearing angle. This refers to its open angle part, right? So it's an open angle glaucoma. When the angle is normal, the iridocorneal angle is normal. We talked about the iridocorneal angle, right? We saw the iris over here, and then we saw the cornea right there, right? Over here was the venous system, and we were, we were talking about this angle right here. This angle, if this is open, it's an open angle glaucoma. If this angle is somehow closed, if this iris kind of moves away into a position like this, this angle is now closed. That would be an, a closed angle or angle closure glaucoma, right? And as you can read, it is the most commonest type of glaucoma, right? So before we really jump into it, into this very specific kind, let's talk about a general thing regarding glaucomas. A question should arise in, in your mind that how is an increased intraocular pressure causing nerve damage? Well, here's the answer. Apoptosis. Now, how would increased intraocular pressure cause apoptosis? The ischemic theory. Let's talk about all of these right now. So this is some basic physiology right here. See, there is this substance called a neutrophin, right? Neutrophin is a common substance. It's a, it's a family of proteins very specific to neurons, neurons and its supporting structures. And every neuron there is in the body, they receive neutrophins, right? Because in the absence of neutrophins, neurons may undergo apoptosis, right? Self-destruction. So what happens in glaucoma is there is a lack of neutrophins in the eye, right? Let's read. So pathogenesis, apoptosis of ganglion cells and neuronal cells due to absence of neutrophins. That is the pathogenesis of every glaucoma. Absence of neutrophins leading to apoptosis. And neutrophins are, as I said, proteins which support neuronal growth and prevent apoptosis. The moment you cut off a supply of neutrophins from a nerve cell, it'll undergo apoptosis, right? How does increased intracranial pressure cause a lack of neutrophins, you ask? Well, well, that is not confirmed, right? There are certain theories, of course, the most impressive one of which is the ischemic theory, right? Let's talk about the ischemic theory for a second. It's really interesting. Let's say we, we draw the retina, right? The light sensitive layer, right? I've exaggerated it greatly, made it thicker than it actually is. And here's the optic nerve, of course. Over here, we have the vitreous humor. In front of it, we have the ciliary body and the lens, right? And we have the iris here. And of course, the cornea to complete everything, right? So, what's the problem? The problem is increased production or decreased outflow or whatever. But the problem is that we have an increased IOP, right? Intraocular pressure. And it is causing tension on all these structures. It is causing tension on the cornea. Structures down here, everywhere. It is also causing tension. It is also causing pressure on this vitreous humor, right? And vitreous humor, it's, it's made of fluid, right? It's incompressible. So a pressure applied here would be directly transmitted onto the retina, onto the neuronal layer, right? Now, we know from basic anatomy, right, right, that there is this blood supply which comes into this retina, right? The retina has its own blood supply. The retina is not avascular, right? So, let's, let's imagine these little arteries, right, running all the way through the retina, right? And arteries over here as well, right? So, if there is increased intracranial pressure, It'll force the vitreous humor on to this whole retina, right? As a result, it'll cause the compression of all these little 
arteries, all these little blood vessels over here, right? Its compression would cause the blood flow to stop, right? So it'll not be receiving any more blood flow because this place is compressed. As a result, there will be ischemia, right? Ischemia is a loss of blood supply. And we know from our previous slide that neutrophins are very, very necessary. And neutrophins are brought by the blood, of course. So if you, if you stop blood from entering the retina, it'll also stop neutrophins from entering the retina, right? And the moment you stop neutrophils, you got apoptosis, right? Simple as that. Of course, this, this doesn't happen in like two days. This takes years and years to happen. But that is the basic idea behind it, right? Ischemic theory. How the ischemia causes a decrease of neutrophins, which causes apoptosis, right? That is the basic pathogenesis of every glaucoma, right? Not specifically the one which we are studying. That is the primary open angle glaucoma, right? Let us go back to our main topic. That is primary open angle glaucoma. See, there are certain predisposing factors to glaucoma. Remember, the first and the foremost increased intraocular pressure, right? Of course, that is basically the, one of the most important things. And if it's in, if, if, if it runs in your family, right, you're predisposed to glaucoma. If you are an African American, right, you are more prone to develop glaucoma. If you have a thin cornea, you are more prone to have glaucoma, right? If you are myopic, if you have a central retinal vein occlusion, we'll be studying this in later chapters. If you're a diabetic, if you're using corticosteroids, all these conditions, they might predispose you into development of glaucoma, right? And specifically, specifically, these four have a very high chance. And, and the most important, of course, is increased intraocular pressure, which is the basic thing which causes glaucoma. So etiology, specifically in case of open angle glaucoma, is that we have a damage of the trabecular meshwork. Do you remember the trabecular meshwork from the last diagram? Okay, let's go back to that diagram again. Here is that diagram. And if you remember, we drew this little opening here covered by this mesh, right? Called the trabecular meshwork. Again, this would again, then again open into canal of Schlem, right? So if something were to happen to this, let's say we have out of nowhere these big chunks of particles, right? And we know that there is a flow of water from here into there, right? And this flow takes these particles with them, right? And as a result, they get all clogged, right? This whole thing gets clogged. So there is no more circulation of water, right? Of the aqueous humor, sorry. As a result, there is production, but there is no exit, right? Which will increase the intraocular pressure, right? And it will predispose us to glaucoma. So that's read. Damage of the trabecular meshwork, which causes cellular debris formation, which clogs the opening of the Schlem's canal, right? So debris formation, clogging or, or blocking of the trabecular meshwork, right? Or if there is certain, if there's a certain pathology which directly damages that whole trabecular meshwork itself, they can cause primary open angle glaucoma, right? There will be a glaucoma, but it would be not because the angle is closing, right? The angle is all, all okay. The angle is open. And what are the symptoms of a primary open angle glaucoma? Well, it's usually bilateral in both eyes, right? Usually, not always. It's slowly progressing. Very important, right? Because closed angle glaucoma, it is not slowly progressing. It occurs very, very rapidly, right? This can take years upon years, right? And it's painless. Very important. Closed angle glaucoma is painful. Very important thing to know. Slowly progressing, painless, and bilateral. And when it gets advanced, it could cause night blindness, right? Because of course, it's a neuropathy, right? Your neurons are damaged. And because it's a it's a optic neuropathy, right? It would cause visual field loss, right? So visual field is decreased because, of course, it's a neuropathy. A part of your retina is not working anymore. What are the clinical features of open angle glaucoma? Of course, increased intraocular pressure, visual field defects because it's an optic neuropathy. The angle is open, very very important. The angle is open, and there is no evidence of a secondary open angle glaucoma, right? If there is an underlying cause, there are, of course, be called secondary open angle glaucoma. But if there is no other cause and the angle is open, that is a primary open angle glaucoma, right? And here's this thing. Glaucomatous changes observed inside the retina, right? One of the most distinct features that you'd, you'd probably notice in a patient having glaucoma is something called 
cupping right c u p p i n g right cupping let me show you what that means see this diagram here this is the eye of a healthy individual now let's imagine that somehow a part of his retina let's say this part of his retina instead of being all flat like this right it somehow dips towards the inside right there is this cupping of the retina so now your new retina looks somewhat like this right it's, it's all all okay here it's all okay down there as well but there's this one portion which has cupped and this area has been of course finished because of apoptosis this is called cupping of the retina right and this cupping is very very obvious when seen through an ophthalmoscope right it can be clearly seen so glaucometrous changes specifically cupping it's observed right and this cupping occurs of course due to apoptosis right how would you treat primary open angle glaucoma well there are two procedures which are easy to understand surgery and laser therapy surgery and laser therapy have similar goals what is that goal opening a new channel for the flow of aqueous humor or perforating that old trabecular meshwork right remember the trabecular meshwork we said that there is a problem that there is debris right which has clogged which has blocked the flow of fluid so if you surgically or through a laser cut open more holes right make more openings inside that trabecular meshwork for the flow of fluid for the flow of aqueous humor that would ease the symptoms of open angle glaucoma right and the fluid would flow okay right that's one way the other way is medication medicines and for this we have to go into a little bit of pharmacology right ah, i know i hate pharmacology myself but there is no way around it right <laughs> there is absolutely no way around pharmacology you can skip pharmacology all your life and it'll catch you again and again and again right no way around it my brother used to say there is no way around the three p's i said what do you mean by three p's he said pathology pharmacology and physiology right he said there is no way around these three right you can skip them all you want and they will catch you again and again and again and you have to learn it no matter what happens right so medications medications which could be used to treat primary open angle glaucoma include stuff which could decrease aqueous humor production right remember that if there is a blockade in the drainage system instead of opening that we could stop the production of more aqueous humor right and that'll also of course result into a decreased intraocular pressure right so how would you do that beta blockers right a little bit of pharmacology let us go back where is it okay here it is so this diagram see these the, the ciliary body has beta 1 receptors right this is very very important to know beta 1 receptors and by stimulating these beta 1 receptors of course it's the sympathetic nervous system which stimulates the beta 1 receptors so by stimulating beta 1 receptors inside the ciliary body we produce aqueous humor what could you do to stop the production of aqueous humor simple give a drug to this guy which stops which blocks the beta 1 receptor right as a result there will be no production of aqueous humor simple as that nothing so difficult right so decrease the production of aqueous humor use beta blockers for example timolol right there are other beta blockers as well another thing which you can do is you can increase the uveoscleral outflow remember the second path right we had a second pathway as well we had the second pathway where we where we saw that the ciliary body itself absorbed fluid absorbed the aqueous humor and it would dispose it off into the episcleral veins right and we said that this is like 10 to 15 percent of the normal drainage right well we could increase this drainage into like maybe 20 percent i don't know right 25 percent using drugs like latanoprost right prostaglandin mimicking drugs right prostaglandin analogs like latanoprost can increase the uveoscleral outflow that's the second thing we can do we can also use diuretics right like for example carbonic anhydrase inhibitors or we could also use another diuretic uh i somehow forgot its name i'll write i'll write it down here if i remember it so these two diuretics could be used right diuretics work by 
by sucking out, by creating a, a kind of a hypertonic environment in the blood, right? As a result, it will suck out the water from the anterior and posterior chambers, right? Yeah, it's called mannitol, by the way. Mannitol, right? So, mannitol and, and other diuretics could be used to decrease intraocular pressure, right? And, there, then, and then we could increase trabecular outflow using meiotics. A meiotic is a drug, of course, which causes meiosis. And we know that meiosis means closing of the iris, right? Or closing of the pupil. In contrast, medriasis is when the pupil opens up, right? Meiosis and medriasis, very common words. So we could use meiosis, right? Now, now you might think, how would closing the iris, right, or the pupil help in drainage? How would that increase trabecular outflow? Very interesting. Here's our diagram again. We know that the trabecular meshwork is located right around here. We also know that the iris is a muscle, right? So the iris has these longitudinal fibers, and it also has these circular fibers here as well. Let's forget about the circular fibers for now. Uh, let's talk about the longitudinal fibers. Now, we know from basic physiology that when a muscle contracts, it gets thicker, right? First, let's talk about what happens in medriasis, right? When the pupil opens up. Okay, we have medriasis here, right? The iris opens up, right? As a result, it's thicker now. The longitudinal muscles contract. They are thicker now. And that is a very big problem. Because see, look at this, look at this uh, trabecular meshwork over here. Now, it was already struggling because of glaucoma, but the moment we contracted the iris upon it, the moment we made this iris thicker, it caused it to get blocked even more, right? It kind of came in front of it, right? Previously, it was here. Now, it kind of moved forward. As a result, this opening gets even more stressed out, right? So, this really, really affects the flow of the aqueous humor, right? It could cause an increased intraocular pressure. So, so medriasis could cause increased IOP. Let's compare that to what happens in meiosis. Ah, there it is, ladies and gents, meiosis. Very clear, very obvious that the moment these longitudinal muscle get relaxed, right? The moment this pupil shrinks and the iris closes down, it's, it gets thinner, right? So previously it was here, right? Now it gets out of the way, right? As a result, there is a better drainage system. As a result, this trabecular meshwork is more open, right? There is nothing in front of its way and there is a good flow of aqueous humor towards it, right? Simple as that. Increase trabecular outflow using meiotics, right? For example, pilocarpine. Pilocarpine is a drug which stimulates the uh, parasympathetic system, right? And of course, we know from basic physiology that the parasympathetic system is responsible for closing the iris, the pupil, and sympathetic system is responsible for opening up the pupil, right? So yeah, and common sense also tells us that for a patient who has glaucoma, we should refrain from giving them drugs which, which you know, which, uh, which makes their sympathetic system active, right? Because that would cause increased intraocular pressure and that would worsen the glaucoma even more, right? So decrease the aqueous production by blocking, by blocking the beta-1 receptors in the ciliary body, right? Using beta blockers like timolol. Increase the uveous scleral outflow, right, from 10% to more using prostaglandin analogs. Use diuretics to suck out the water, like for example, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. Or use a drug which causes meiosis, which causes the closing of the iris. As a result, you will have a little bit of an improvement in the drainage of the trabecular system. And yeah, that's about it. Thank you for watching. Like, subscribe, and share if you learned something. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Have a nice day.